Well, welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. And for those of you who perhaps have never listened to our shows, which are on every third Friday of the month from 7 till 8 p.m., we're both licensed medical herbalists who trained in England and graduated there with a degree in herbal medicine. And we run a clinic in Garberville where we consult with clients about a wide range of conditions, and we manufacture all our own certified organic herbal extracts, which are either grown on our CCUF certified herb farm or which are sourced from other certified organic suppliers. So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville, 91.1 FM, and from about 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, uh, you're all invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated, to this month's topic. The number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is one 800 Five six eight three seven two three. That's K M U D RAD. Uh, we can also be reached toll free on one eight 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 W B M Herb for further questions during normal business hours Monday through Friday. So this month we're again very pleased and fortunate uh, to welcome Dr. Ray Pete back to this show, and we will be examining further some common misconceptions surrounding thyroid treatment and the apparently normal thyroid test in clients with obvious manifestations of thyroid imbalance. And we have our see- ourselves uh, seen remarkable progress made uh, with clients with many and varied symptoms that improve dramatically uh, with diet and lifestyle changes that promote thyroid health, uh, revealing a prior lowered thyroid function even in the absence of diagnostic tests that show no obvious problems. So welcome again to this month's show, Dr. Pete. Hello, thank you. It's very, very kind of you to join us again. Okay. Oh, I think we should. Um, Dr. Pete has over 40 years' experience. I want to introduce yeah. Dr. Pete's um, experience for those of you who haven't heard Dr. Pete on our radio show last year. But he has over 40 years' experience in lecturing, uh, teaching, writing, editing, and nutritional counseling. So we're um, very happy to have him join our show tonight. And he also has a Ph.D. in biochemistry, and he also teaches on physiology and basically functions as an endocrinologist. Does that sound right, Dr. Pete? Yeah, my Ph.D. is in biology, but my work was all in physiology and biochemistry. So we wanted to talk about thyroid disease because it seems to be such a chronic epidemic, and we thought we'd just start by introducing what thyroid disease is in case there are listeners that are not aware of what their thyroid is or where it's located. So, Dr. Pete, what would you describe low thyroid disease to be or hypothyroidism? Um, it's basically a slowing of the oxidative met- metabolism, uh, and that means your uh, biological efficiency falls drastically uh, because we rely almost entirely on oxidative metabolism. Um, In emergencies, we can uh, use uh, glycolytic non-oxidative metabolism, but uh, then we have to uh, make up for it by re-oxidizing the lactic acid that was produced uh, in the oxygen deprivation or energy over stressing and so everything that is a, a human or mammalian or even a com- complex organism depends on the thyroid uh, because all cellular activity uh, to be efficient requires uh, oxidative metabolism so it- Thyroid, in a sense, is controlling the oxygen to all the cells in our system. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And so one of the um, the effects is that our carbon dioxide production is kept at a a fairly high rate in relation to oxygen consumption, and that keeps our tendency to produce lactic acid very low. Uh, so uh, if a person is low thyroid, even at rest, they can seem uh, metabolically as if they're uh, doing stressful activity. They can uh, chronically have elevated lactic acid. 
And is this something that is, involves, um, like chronic fatigue? People's muscles are chronically fatigued, even though they're not really even doing any exercises that might seem to be using their muscles besides just walking around? Yeah, yes, because uh, when you don't use oxygen efficiently, you have to make lactic acid to keep the cells alive. And the lactic acid then has to be reoxidized in your liver to uh, turn it eventually to carbon dioxide. And um, so just sitting passively for a hypothyroid person can uh, be the same as running uh, at high speed for a healthy person. And about 60 years ago, it was very well known that a hypothyroid person has trouble relaxing their muscles and nerves. And so um, there were publications showing that uh, you can just about invariably diagnose hypothyroidism with a simple uh, thump of the ankle tendon uh, to the gastric nemius muscle. Which is a calf muscle. Uh, Yeah. And uh, when you're kneeling, and uh, you thump that, you can see that the relaxation is delayed. Uh, that that was uh, very well established as a good diagnostic method in the 1930s and 40s. But uh, the labs and pharmaceutical companies couldn't sell anything. Uh, uh, you, you can use a, just a table knife or a, a, a wooden a hammer handler, anything to thump the tendon, and it just takes about two minutes to do it, and so it's a very uneconomical uh, business for for doctors in the pharmaceutical industry to be able to diagnose uh, the condition so simply. So is this why the blood test came about that tests the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone? Yeah, for the first uh, 20 years or so, uh, Doctors were told not to use the Achilles relaxation test or the basal metabolic uh, oxygen consumption test or any of the proven absolute uh, confirmations of hypothyroidism because they had what they called the scientific blood test to prove it, and that was called the protein-bound iodine test, and that convinced uh, doctors all over the country that were previously 40% of the population had shown some evidence of being hypothyroid. The new blood test showed that only 5% were hypothyroid. And what? And so for, for 20 years, this test was used convincing the whole medical world that very few people are seriously hypothyroid. And then in the 1960s, it turned out that protein-bound iodine has essentially nothing to do with thyroid hormone functioning. And what about the TSH that's used today? Do you uh, think that's relevant? Yeah, when the uh, the, um, protein-bound iodine uh, test was thrown out, they looked for other tests which uh, conveniently proved to be even more expensive than the protein-bound iodine. And uh, that finally has settled in on the TSH test as as the favored one. And they can measure it very precisely, but it just doesn't, uh, it isn't clear what it means in, in many cases because other things uh, can raise it or lower it other than the uh, the absence or excess of thyroid hormone. So if someone is low thyroid or is not low thyroid, they can have varying levels of this TSH, which the doctors are saying is thyroid stimulating hormone, but which you're suggesting and other scientists are suggesting doesn't really relate specifically to thyroid. Uh, That's true. And uh, it has some uh, bad side effects. It promotes inflammation in itself. So, Low thyroid people not only lack the metabolic energy, but they tend very often to have very high TSH levels, and the TSH is causing uh, some tissue damage chronically. Wow. 
Okay, so what do you think is causing low thyroid function in a lot of people in the U.S. today? I think, well, uh, 70 years ago, it sometimes included an iodine deficiency, but with the iodination of uh, table salt, uh, other factors uh, became far more important. Uh, I've only seen uh, the uh, iodine deficiency uh, condition a few times in people from uh, South America or the, the mountains of Mexico. And uh, many times it's a protein deficiency uh, or an excess of eating certain foods that inhibit the thyroid, such as raw cabbage or even an excess of any of the cabbage family foods. So that would include kale, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts? And mustard and watercress. And uh, even if they're cooked, if you eat a huge amount of them, that sometimes can be, be enough to uh, make you hypothyroid. Is this uh, anything to do with the sulfur groups? Uh, the sulfur? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a, a combination of a, a carbon that contains an oxygen or nitrogen and a sulfur group. Okay. And uh, so there groups. are known medical uh, chemicals that are used to specifically inhibit the thyroid to treat hyperthyroidism. Okay, right. I, I know in the uh, previous uh, uh, interviews that um, we've done um, that you've very much brought out the polyunsaturated oils as being um, definite um, antagonists to thyroid function and, in fact, yeah. downright uh, thyroid destructive in, in some yeah, ways. Yeah, they antagonize the thyroid function at several levels. For example, they inhibit the uh, proteolytic enzyme in the gland itself, uh, which are needed to secrete, to form and secrete the hormone, and they bind to the protein in the bloodstream that transports thyroid, preventing the transport to the tissues, and they uh, block several of the active sites in the cell, uh, the points at which thyroid should bind to enliven the cell. The, polyunsaturated fats. So they're um, affecting thyroid health at the production location, the thyroid gland, loca uh, the transportation through the bloodstream, as well as at the tissue level where the tissues and the cells can pick up the thyroid hormone. Yes, and, and, and they act on several other parts of the system, including indirectly on the TSH and uh, every other part of the metabolic system. So these polyunsaturated fatty acids are found in very high levels are, are mainly consisting of vegetable oils, corn oil, soy oil, sesame seed oil, safflower, canola, rapeseed, and canola are the same, and fish, hemp, and flaxseed oils. So a lot of these oils that are purported to be good for our health are actually quite thyroid toxic and long-term use could lead to conditions that are common in low thyroid and as detrimental as cancer. Uh, yeah, and there's one which isn't really a, a fatty acid, but it's a highly unsaturated molecule, uh, carotene, which is the mm. precursor to uh, vitamin A. Uh, it not only blocks the uh, cellular sites that use vitamin A, but as a polyunsaturated molecule, it also uh, blocks the thyroid function every place that uh, the, hmm. the vegetable oils do. Wow. So th this would be uh, just basically ingesting lots of cooked carrots, that would be the... Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. And cooked pumpkin, anything that had high levels of carotene. Okay, and that's that uh, yellow, yellow pigment or the orange pigment. Yeah, some of the yeah. studies uh, oh. confused people because they knew that vitamin A was protective against cancer, but they saw that... Uh, some types of cancer increased with uh, supplementation of uh, carotene. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So it's that the carotene blocks the receptor so your body can't use the vitamin A that's in your diet. Mm-hmm. And so it, it sits in the receptor, but it doesn't stimulate or receptor. It sits somewhere in the cell that doesn't stimulate the vitamin, the effects of vitamin A, the protective cancer protecting effects of vitamin A. And uh, vitamin A and thyroid work so closely together biologically that uh, the protein that transports them is a single protein. It's called transthyretin for uh, retinol and uh, thyroid transport. And in the 1930s, one of the ways of confirming that a person had died from hypothyroidism was that the uh, steroid-forming tissues turned red because of the accumulated uh, carotene Uh, because uh, you can't use vitamin A if you don't have thyroid, and so the carotene uh, accumulates in the steroid-forming tissue and makes them red. Would this be any any reason now behind the uh, basis of people with uh, yellow calluses being very apparent on their soles or their palms? Yeah, that's one of the old ways to diagnose hypothyroidism. Okay. (laughs) Wow. No, I think you've told us that before, Dr. Pete. Um, we're going to pause here for a moment. Okay, well, just uh, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville, 91.1 FM, and from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, uh, you're invited to call in with any questions uh, related or unrelated to this month's topic of thyroid disorder, and um, we can hopefully cover iron uh, and a few other subjects. Uh, but again, this month we're very pleased and fortunate to welcome Dr. Raymond Pete back to the show, uh, and we're going to be continuing to examine some common misconceptions surrounding thyroid treatment. Okay, so Sarah, did you want to carry on with... Yeah, I, I printed yeah. out a long list of um, symptoms that are common in low thyroid disease. So we're, we've been talking about... Uh, low thyroid disease, which is known as hypothyroidism, and we've talked about what it is, what causes it, but I want to mention some symptoms and signs that accompany the disease because so many people seem to be suffering from these symptoms. Um, okay, well, the, the list is pretty exhaustive. It may seem uh, it may seem a little extreme, but uh, pretty much all of these will be will be apparent in some people. So things like the obvious ones like less stamina than others, given that the uh, metabolic rate uh, helps us uh, produce energy and gives us kind of gives us life. Uh, less energy than others. Um, a long recovery period after any activity. Uh, there's also the inability um, to uh, Uh, fight infection, uh, sort of low-grade chronic infections. Uh, Cold hands and feet are very uh, kind of uh, symptomatic of low thyroid. Uh, And then high, usually high or uh, rising uh, cholesterol in low thyroid patients does seem to be uh, fairly fairly, uh, common. And then things like uh, dry hair, dry skin, hair loss, uh, dry cracking skin. Um, Also, though, the other thing that seems to be contrary to dry skin is that you can have acne on the face, the shoulders, the chest, and the back. Dr. Pete, why would symptoms such as like dry skin and dry hair and acne and oily skin both be symptoms of low thyroid? Um, Partly it's the close connection between vitamin A and thyroid. Uh, The skin needs vitamin A to uh, differentiate properly. And uh, mucous membranes require vitamin A, too, so that uh, in an extreme deficiency, the surface of the eye uh, becomes uh, scaly and uh, like snake skin. Uh, but the, the, uh, the lack of both thyroid and vitamin A can uh, cause lots of skin problems, including plugging the pores, uh, and allowing infection to set in because the uh, the thyroid uh, doesn't allow the immune cells to uh, function properly, and uh, thinning of the skin just because it isn't growing fast enough. Um, estrogen is contrary to vitamin A's effect. Uh, progesterone and vitamin A are are closely connected. Uh, so that when you have enough vitamin A and thyroid, even your skin can produce uh, progesterone and other steroids. 
and uh, when they're lacking, then estrogen takes effect, and it tends to prematurely uh, harden or keratinize the uh, skin cells. They're called keratinized because they become horny. The, the uh, juicy cell collapses and um, becomes just a, a bit of leathery scale-like material, like mm. it makes up horn or hair. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's accelerated by estrogen and uh, retarded, and uh, the, the cells are allowed to stay vital and moist longer um, when there's enough thyroid, vitamin A, and progesterone. All those good things. Sandra, do you want to carry on with? Okay, well, I don't want to don't want to bore people with too many too many different symptoms. I know, but so. there's quite a lot of symptoms yeah. here that okay, I think so people. Okay, th- so things like exhaustion. Then uh, we mentioned that in the very beginning, uh, physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion, uh, inability to work full time or work hard, or feel that other people just seem to have that more go than you do, uh, and under, not understanding that, a lack of motivation, a lack of concentration. Um, Broken or peeling fingernails, uh, we've mentioned dry skin, uh, tinnitus, a ringing in the ears, another fairly common uh, symptom. Uh, things like joint pain, um, fluid retention, uh, almost to the point of congestive heart failure, uh, swollen legs uh, that make it difficult to walk or painful, uh, blood pressure problems seem to be fairly frequent amongst low thyroid people, um, as do varicose veins. Uh, um, and that's something that many doctors are completely confused about is the uh, hypothyroidism typically increases the viscosity of the blood and uh, raises the blood pressure mm-hmm. uh, so that uh, a slightly hypothyroid person uh, might have low blood pressure but uh, a very high percentage of the people with hypertension are simply hypothyroid and correcting it with a, a supplement of thyroid, even to the point of making them hyperthyroid, will lower the blood pressure. Because that's just, it just seems so counterintuitive to what most people would understand as being hyperthyroid. Well, it's contrary to what we were taught in medical yeah, school. No, that's what I'm we were taught yeah. high blood pressure is a sign of high thyroid function. Low Can blood be, pressure yeah. is a sign of low thyroid function. Mm-hmm. So to hear the opposite and to see that in our own clients mm-hmm. is astounding. That mm-hmm. when they take a thyroid supplement, their blood pressure comes down. And and you would and you would think before before this uh, came came about that you think that normally your your imagination of thyroid is a stimulating hormone when actually it really improves your sleep and calms you down and lowers your blood pressure and lowers your resting pulse. You know from a from a, a point of maybe 90 or more of, a, of an adrenaline uh, high pulse, it um, brings it down. Um, I've seen two people who chronically had a, a pulse <clears throat> around 180 beats per minute. Wow. <laughs> and one of them had had it like that for about 20 years. Gosh. And both of them, within a couple of weeks of taking thyroid, had it down to a normal 90 or 100 beats. Wow. I wonder what they thought. <laughs> so that's another thing is a, a racing pulse. What do you consider to be a healthy, normal thyroid pulse, and what do you consider to be a low thyroid pulse? What are those ranges? Because, of course, in medical school we were taught 70 to 80 beats per minute is normal. If you're higher than 80 beats per minute, you could have a disease. So what uh, is your opinion on this, Dr. Pete? There have been uh, several studies of uh, people of different ages, for example, high school kids, and the ones who were healthy and uh, got the best grades and had the best at- attention had a resting pulse of averaging 85 beats per minute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, when old people on heart pacemakers were given mental exams uh, with the pacemaker set at the usual 70 beats, uh, they had the usual old person's memory and reasoning ability when they cranked the pacemaker up to 85 per minute every mental function improved there you go cool so that's that's pretty interesting because that's again we're taught that high thyroid excess thyroid hyperthyroid is diagnosed by a racing pulse Uh, there is an old doctrine that uh, around the 
beginning of the 20th century, uh, they called it the rate of living theory, that the faster your heart beat, the sooner you, you would die. <laughs> and that the experiment that defined that and proved it for so many people was to put some cantaloupe seeds in a dish in a saucer of water and watch them sprout. The ones that sprouted the soonest and grew the fastest died the soonest, but they didn't put any soil. <laughs> <laughs> so and they if, used if up you, all their food. Huh? If you and that's someone, what they were using to support that rate of living yeah, theory? Yeah, it's oh, just an embarrassment for, <laughs> that's, for science. That's science. <laughs> it's like if you gave a person uh, all the thyroid they needed but no food, naturally <laughs> they would die quickly. They'd get skinny. I think, Dr. Pete, there's a couple of callers on the line, so let's uh, let's take the first caller. Okay, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, is it me? Yes, you're on the air. There was no sound. Hi, thank you all. I have a couple of related questions. Okay, go ahead. If, if a person was um, quite um, low in thyroid and it wasn't um, known for a long time, like more than 20 years, um, I wonder what kind of damages that could cause. And um, about 12 minutes in, Dr. P talked about tissue damage, and maybe you could tell me what he meant more by that. And um, then once taking supplementation, um, when could you expect to be much better? Um, I have been getting supplements for 20 years after not having any, and I'm still quite incapacitated. Oh, uh, usually doctors prescribe thyroxin because that isn't the thyroid hormone. It it has to be turned into the active thyroid hormone, which is called uh, triiodothyronine, or T3, in the liver to be active. And the, the thyroid gland secretes a little. But when a doctor prescribes thyroxin, there's no chance that you'll be overdosed because uh, as you increase it, uh, one of the first patients I uh, heard about who had uh, a myxedema coma became totally unresponsive from hypothyroidism. She had been mildly hypothyroid for years, and they prescribed uh, 100 micrograms of uh, Synthroid, and she became more hypothyroid, and they doubled it, and when they reached 500 micrograms, she went into a coma. What and about, um, oh, sorry. That, that was supplementing more and more thyroxin, but when in the hospital they gave her an injection of the active hormone T3, she came out of the coma in just a few hours and was completely well after that. Uh, you can have a complete, just amazing recovery from many things in just a matter of minutes in some cases. Uh, for example, a doctor who had been having agonizing breast pain, uh, especially premenstrually for uh, increasing over the recent years. Uh, I visited and she uh, said that uh, that was her main problem. I, I gave her a 10 microgram uh, tablet of, of Cytomel. She went in to, uh, said she would see me in an hour when she finished with the patient. In 10 minutes, she came out saying, uh, I can't believe that it stopped. And uh, that's a very typical thing in less than an hour with just T3 uh, well, pains such, mm -hmm. as, such as menstrual or, or breast pain uh, will stop totally. I have taken both of those and also um, and now I have the like armor. Um, it's not it's not um, synthetic, but um, so you're saying that no matter how much damage over like a couple of decades, all of that could be repaired. Uh, yeah, some types of damage such as osteoporosis. Uh, when your thyroid is very low, uh, your one compensation is that your pituitary tends to swell up and overproduce prolactin, and uh, that. That's one of the factors in causing breast pain and uh, disturbed uh, salt regulation and so on. But prolactin is a major factor in causing loss of bone. And uh, 
as at menopause, very often prolactin goes up because thyroid has gone down, and the prolactin coincides with extreme loss of bone. And so uh, it takes sometimes a long time of uh, correcting your diet along with thyroid before you restore your bones. But I have seen a couple of people, uh, one had her um, x-ray bone exams showing uh, tremendous, I think it was 20% increase in less than a year when she was taking thyroid. Okay, um, I'm going to go so other people can speak to you, but um, I, I don't have a thyroid, so I, I don't know if that makes a, you know, if that, it, that Actually, makes much more of a difference. But um, I'm wondering if the question you're wanting to ask is what would happen to someone's body? How much damage is that's there? That's what I was asking because for 20 years I, the doctor removed my thyroid, but they never did anything about checking back. So I went for more than 20 years. Without taking any supplementation right. at all after a thyroid yeah. was removed. So what yeah. would you, I mean, do you think there's damage that's been done in this client, Dr. Reed, that, that's oh, it, irreparable? It, it just increases your stress and uh, slows your recovery from stress. And so it, it tends to age you uh, faster than usual, uh, just like uh, working too hard would. But... Those changes, uh, for example, uh, bone growth, uh, I grew an inch and a half in my 40s when I t started taking thyroid. Wow. Uh, so uh, it, it happened over just a period of a few months. And uh, so even uh, lifelong life uh, things can be corrected pretty quickly. Thanks again. Bye. Very good. Okay, well, let's see if we have any other callers on the line. I think there's one or two at least. Okay, you're on the air? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask two questions, and I'll take my answer on the air. Okay. What is, first of all, let me say, I've had, I was thyroid toxic okay. in form. Thyroid toxicosis? Or? Okay, yeah, to yeah, thyroid toxicosis. Okay. Went into storm for four months, was treated with I-131, and for the last 30 years, I've been taking Synthroid. Okay? Okay. Now, here's my question. Could the doctor please explain the connection between the adrenals, the, um, the, uh, the in the brain, the, uh, pituitary, and the thyroid gland, it seems to be a merry-go-round that goes around and around and back and forth. Okay, can you t possibly turn your radio down if you haven't already because we seem to be getting some feedback interference and we can barely hear your question. Uh, uh, my radio's not on. Okay. Bizarre, okay. All right. It's uh, breaking up. Okay. okay, I think I heard your question. You, you said basically you had thyroid toxicosis, you were treated with uh, iodine-131, and then you were given a thyroid replacement? Right. Okay, and your your main question was? What is the connection between the adrenals and the stress factor? Okay. The, the, uh, the pituitary and the thyroid, how do they communicate with each other, and just how bad is stress? Okay, there you go. So Dr. Pete, did you hear that question? I think most of it. Um, when your thyroid is low, uh, you because you don't, have the efficiency with oxidative metabolism, you turn a lot of your sugar into lactic acid, right. and then your liver spends more energy converting the lactic acid back into sugar. So low blood sugar is constantly a problem in hypothyroidism. And the compensation for that is that first your adrenal medulla secretes a lot of adrenaline to force your liver to give up any sugar it has stored. And uh, when that doesn't uh, meet, meet your needs for sugar, then the adrenal cortex uh, begins over-secreting cortisol mm -hmm. to uh, break down protein or muscle tissue to make sugar out of it to uh, keep your energy up. And the uh, falling blood sugar itself and the rising uh, uh, adrenaline 
both of those are signals to your brain to increase the stress hormones. Uh, the um, ACTH is produced by the pituitary gland, but also uh, other brain and pituitary hormones, including prolactin, increase along with it. And uh, the ACTH is what drives your cortisol uh, up, and the cortisol is what causes uh, the most acute uh, tissue damage, loss of muscle mass, and uh, quick loss of uh, bone structure and so on. Okay, it's also, also weight gain, isn't it? This is low, low muscle mass in relation to weight and um, fat? Yeah, as your um, ability to burn fat right. decreases right. with your falling thyroid, the cortisol uh, eats up your um, skeletal muscles that burn fat, and so uh, the unburned fat uh, gets laid down in your trunk and neck and face area. Right. Uh, it's probably some kind of a defensive reaction to uh-huh. uh, pad pad your organs when you're uh, under chronic stress. Right, right. Because muscles muscles burn a lot of energy, and so therefore, uh, muscular people can eat a fairly high calorie diet because that energy is being consumed by the muscle. Whereas people that have an excess of fat and a, and a lack of muscle tone. Uh, can very easily get fat on a very small amount of calories. Is is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if that answered the... I'm pretty sure it um, helped to answer the lady's question, if not answer it completely. And so. um, a lot of people who have um, measured a deficiency of adrenal function, uh, that seems to be a medically popular diagnosis, is adrenal fatigue or insufficiency. Right. But... Uh, it, to get any adrenal function, you need um, the vitamins, vitamin A especially, mm-hmm. and thyroid. So uh, uh, many people have been diagnosed as having Addison's disease simply mm-hmm. because their thyroid was so low that uh, they couldn't produce steroids. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other factor for producing steroids is uh, cholesterol and uh so if you have both low cholesterol and low thyroid, mm. then your adrenals aren't going to be able to make the uh, steroids such as progesterone and and pregnenolone and cortisol. So really what some doctors would say, oh, you have adrenal fatigue, and that would be maybe diagnosed by a saliva test. Really what they need to be looking at is the thyroid function and making sure those people are getting enough vitamin A and that their cholesterol is high enough or they're getting enough in their diet. Yeah. I, do we have any other callers? We don't. Okay, so let's carry on with. I wanted to um, say another thing that I believe this is what you think, Doctor B, is the temperature and pulse can be a measurement of of one sign of the a low thyroid function. So, how would you say a temperature is affected with someone that has a low thyroid? What would their waking morning temperature typically be in the range of? Usually around 98 degrees oral temperature. And um, then after they eat, what would their temperature be? It should pretty quickly pop right up to 98.6, 98.8. And then as they get some muscle activity going uh, during the day, uh, it can even rise above that 99 degrees is good in the afternoon. Okay, so this is a normal function. First thing in the morning, your temperature should be around 98. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, I just want to say, of all the clients that I've had take their temperatures and pulses, about 2 out of 50 have had, since I've been doing this temperature and pulse thing um, all of last year, about 50 of them have had much lower temperatures than that, and only 2 have had what you just described, Dr. P. So... Is that? Can you say most of them, if they had low thyroid symptoms in conjunction with those low temperatures, would be a diagnosis of low thyroid? Yeah, when you, um, if you look at the whole picture, uh, the Achilles reflex and uh, their symptoms and their um, how, how many calories they can burn without getting fat and uh, how how well they sleep and uh, the activity efficiency uh, to 
be able to relax instantly after the exertion and to be able to go to sleep quickly. Uh, all of those go with the uh, good temperature curve. So it's it's something that can be used in conjunction with symptoms. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. I think we have a caller on there. Yeah, we do. Go ahead, caller. Well, hi, this is this is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hey, hi, Andrew Kevin. and Sarah. Hi. Uh, so I had a question about uh, Hashimoto's disease. Um, I was diagnosed with that, and um, understand that it interferes with the absorption of thyroid. And I'm wondering if Dr. Pete can speak about. Hashimoto's, and what, if anything, can be done to um, to alleviate it, cure it? Um, the disease was originally defined as um, infiltration of white blood cells into the inflamed thyroid gland, and uh, uh, since they didn't necessarily like to cut out a piece of gland to confirm that that's what was wrong, they started looking at antibodies in your blood and uh, assuming that you would have the uh, uh, infiltration and inflammation of the gland if you find the antibodies circulating in the blood. But in fact, the antithyroid antibodies uh, overlap with many other problems, including arthritis. Uh, and so the, the antibodies aren't strictly uh, clearly diagnostic, but they do indicate that something is inflamed. And since the thyroid is the basic anti-inflammatory hormone and organ, it's uh, very often the thyroid that is the main problem when you have these antibodies. And there have been several studies in which uh, simply supplementing even with thyroxin for six months or a year, the, uh, the antibodies will decrease and and the, the whole prob- problem is solved. Mm-hmm. One thing I've heard of also is, is of taking low dose naltrexone as as a way of um, of helping with the condition. Have you heard of that? Uh, when when you're hypothyroid and produce lactic acid too easily you tend to accumulate endorphins. Endorphins are uh, produced in response to the signal of increased lactic acid uh, to compensate for the stress by uh, acting like morphine equivalents. And uh, the endorphins themselves limit your uh, physiological functions uh, in a protective way, sort of a, like a, a localized kind of hibernation. Uh, oh. And so the naloxone or naltrexone will uh, clear those out. Uh, sometimes it, in uh, two or three days, you can see a person come out of depression or a lethargic state. Or if there was a study in California of demanded people who were given very big doses of naloxone for uh, several days or several weeks, and uh, their dementia improved just by uh, blocking the endorphins. And how long is it that somebody should be on naltrexone with the conditions like Hashimoto's? Is there any problem with long-term use? Um, no, but I, I usually see good results in just two or three days. So uh, I think the, the basic Treatment is a good diet and a thyroid supplement as needed, and then uh, the naloxone or naltrexone is is a good thing to try once in a while. To, if it uh, makes you feel better, then it probably was uh, breaking up a pattern. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your call, Kevin. We okay, have two other there... callers on no, the line. Go ahead. You're on the air? Yes, thank you for taking my call. My name is Mike, and I have a question for the doctor. And earlier I heard the show, the doctor was listing a number of vegetables and some uh, polyunsaturated oils that had something to do with um, making something higher, and I'm assuming that had to do with the thyroid. And my question is, 
it would cod liver oil be placed in with those other oils? And I'll take my question off the air. Thank you. Okay. Um, the fish oils are long molecules compared to the seed oils, and they are also more unstable to oxidative breakdown. And the fact that they are long means that they don't inhibit our enzymes for metabolizing fats as seriously as the seed oils, such as canola or corn oil, do. But their instability means that by the time they get in the blood, they're pretty well oxidized. And uh, several studies have shown that uh, the fish oils do uh, have an anti-inflammatory effect, but only their oxidative breakdown products, which include some serious toxins, only those are really active anti-inflammatory substances. And what they're doing is poisoning the immune system, suppressing immunity. So temporarily, it's uh, effective for alleviating symptoms, but in the long run, it's not good because the breakdown products include things like uh, acrolein and uh, uh, several of the uh, uh, free radical oxidative uh, uh, damage uh, fractions of the broken down fats. And those are both very dangerous, toxic substances. Mm-hmm. So not only does it suppress your immune system, it also, through this um, immune system suppression, it's also releasing toxic substances that yeah, are... And there, there are really quite a few articles that people don't get to hear about showing that the uh, fish oils uh, contribute to atherosclerosis and uh, increase the risk of metastatic cancer and... Uh, uh, that are toxic to the brain and so on. Uh, uh, the uh, the commercial promotion of the fish oils, uh, they happen to never mention those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we've got two other callers on the line, Dr. Pete, so let's let's take the next caller. You're on the air? Hello? Hello, you're on the air. Hi, my name is Jenny. Um, uh, thank you for, for speaking, Dr. Pete. Um I've been on Armour Thyroid for some years now, and they want to change over, uh, change me and put me on one of the synthetic thyroids. And I'm wondering uh, if there are any disadvantages to doing that. Um, and also, I'm wondering uh, about if the synthetic thyroids. I've heard they 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 are made with milk products, which I can't tolerate cow's milk. So I'm I'm wondering about those two things. Um, the company that makes armor also makes a synthetic called Thyrolar, which was based on the original armor thyroid product. And uh, the FDA has been uh, requiring a lot of formula changes in the natural thyroid. So uh, it seems to vary in quality according to uh, the interference by the FDA. And the Thyrolar, as a synthetic, I think is uh, it has been pretty steady over the last uh, 40 or 50 years uh, since, since it is just a synthetic chemical. And it's very equivalent to the traditional armor. But uh, you can find out on the armor company's website, Forest Pharmaceuticals, uh, whether there's milk in it, uh, several other products contain the same synthetic chemicals. Uh, I get them from Mexico. One is called Novotirol, and the other one is Sino Plus. Uh, and uh, they're very similar to Armour Thyroid. So when you um, see your doctor, if you want to ask them to, if you want to request that you have a prescription for Thyrolar, that's spelled T H Y R O. L A R Thyrolar. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, I think we might just have time for one more caller before we need to wrap up here. So you're on the air. Yes, I'm on the air. Okay. Uh, this is not related to thyroid. I actually wanted to ask you 
about um, something that has to do with tuberculosis. Okay. Yep. And staph infections. Okay. I've had um, somebody um, at Red River Rural and also at um, at Garberville Clinic. I've been diagnosed with staph. Okay. Um, okay. How do I treat this? Okay, I mean, when you say you've been diagnosed with staph, do you have multiple uh, lesions resembling yes, small boils? Um, all over my body. Yeah. Okay. Well. Right. And it started a cat scratch, went up my nose, and then it went into my eyes, and it went all over my body, and then my husband caught it too, and they had to put a wick into his chest because he abscessed. Wow. Is uh, I don't mean to be personal, but is there is there any kind of um, uh, drug abuse or any kind of um, no. very very low immune status amongst either of you? Um, immune status. Was that? I mean, are you normally? Do you normally get coughs and colds more frequently than other people, or any uh, any kind of infections more easily than other people? Do you have any kind of history of um, having a weak immune system? Um, um, I'd say that I get a cold every once in a while because my stepson comes back from, um, CR and okay. he always gets a cold. Okay. All right. I, th I think without, without going too far into it, because we really don't have the time, I, th I would certainly uh, come up with a few suggestions of things to try, and then we'll try it over to Dr. Pete and see what Dr. Pete would um, uh, be thinking about. I know there's one product, and it's actually manufactured in, in England. I don't know if you can get it in America, but basically mm -hmm. it's an allicin-rich garlic extract. Now, Dr. Pete may not like this much, I don't know, because it does contain a lot of sulfur, and those sulfhydryl groups that we were talking about to begin with that you find in the brassica family. Right. A thyroid suppressive. So um, the anacin was used very successfully for staff, for, for internal staff. Um, mm. So that's basically one solution. Um, other immune stimulating herbs from an herbal perspective uh, would certainly be useful to improve your tissues resistance uh, to the, uh, the, the byproducts of the staph infection that cause that boil and that breakdown of that tissue. But Dr. Pete, I'm very interested to hear if you if you have any comments to make on um uh, staph infection, a systemic staph infection. Um, mm -hmm. oh, well, I'll talk to you directly then. Yeah, but go ahead, and Dr. Pete will um, talk on the air now. Yeah. I, I've seen a few cases of uh, chronic infection, some that had gone on for decades, uh, that cleared up with uh, just thyroid or thyroid and nutrition. Huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good to cover the bases uh, mm -hmm. Even even some antibiotics, tetracycline, for example, mm -hmm. happens to uh, have a structure that's parallel to vitamin K mm -hmm. and to the active ingredient of aloe and cascara. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those three or four molecules uh, mm -hmm. have a, a very beneficial effect on your immune system as well as being slightly uh, suppressive to... A um, variety of bacteria. Um, doctor, have you um, have you ever known somebody who has gone into the VA? Um, my husband is a VA clinic, and he's gone, and we were worried about that. I had a friend whose uh, doctors insisted that they first were going to amputate his feet, and then they decided they would amputate his legs because. Uh, they they said the infection in the bones uh, made it incurable. And since I had read Broda Barnes' book and had seen a couple of cases of mm -hmm. chronic infections clearing up myelitis and such, uh, I made my old friend take thyroid for a while. Uh -huh. And the uh, ulcers, he had uh, gangrene into the bones of Ooh. his feet. Uh, within two weeks, the sores had closed and he was putting on his dress shoes and going to lodge, 
Oh, my. And we went through cycles. Uh, I think there were three cycles where his doctor made him stop the thyroid. The bone infection came back after two or three months. And uh, I would see his feet rotting, make him take his thyroid. And uh, his feet each time cleared up totally. But okay. the doctor finally uh, said, well, there's still infection in there so we mm-hmm. have to cut them off okay i'm gonna have to have to call it okay. call it a night there thank you very much for all of your calls and dr pete thank you very much for joining us again thank on the you show um, thank I, you also, I want to mention that uh, dr pete's website is very extensive has lots of articles on it very much researched scientific information so may, some of it may seem counter uh, controversial or counter to what we're told but it's scientific information that you can all check out his website is www www.raypeat.org and that's spelled r-a-y-p-e-a-t uh, no it's dot com now sorry dot com raypeat.com okay folks so that's the website go check it out thank you very much dr pete for joining us mm-hmm, and you. i just want to say um thank you dr pete and for all those listeners who are interested in trying to eat right for their thyroid health um, we can be contacted monday through friday normal business hours toll free 888 888- Nine two six four three seven two, which is WBM Herb. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for all the callers. Uh, thank you for being out there and asking questions. And uh, and also, Doctor Pete is available for nutritional counselling from his website directly, okay. which is www.raypete.com. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Pete. Thank you, and good night.